to in the choices that we make here in our lives. In 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 4 is where we'll begin, looking at this idea of sin and what sin is. Uh, I'm curious how many of you on a life raft? Anybody on a life raft? Maybe? Uh, no, no, nobody is jumping up saying I've got one. I, I Personally, I don't think I need one. Uh, I'm, I'm not overly concerned about uh, my boat drowning. I don't have a boat, and so I don't feel like I need one. But you know, if I was in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean and I was drowning, I would really like to have a life raft. It would be especially useful to me in a situation like that. The plan of salvation is for people who understand they're dying. And it's for people who understand that they are lost. And so understanding God's plan of salvation starts here with understanding that there's something that I'm lacking and something that I need. 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 4 it says, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is Lawlessness. So what's lawlessness? That, that's the idea here is what he's talking about. Sin. And sin is lawlessness and how those two go hand in hand. Now, sometimes the word and is used in a way to mean in addition to. And sometimes the word and is used to mean because. And we would use it that way just in our language as well. And I want you to notice that in this verse. So everyone who practices sin practices lawlessness. And here's why. That would be a way to read it. So here's why. Because sin is lawlessness. That's what sin is. So why is this valuable to us to make that point and to start our lesson here? Well, sometimes sin's defined differently. People will define it and they'll say, well, sin is just I feel bad about something I'm doing. That's not sin. Uh, because I may feel bad about something that is sin, but just because I feel bad about something doesn't necessitate sin. Or society may disapprove of something, but because society disapproves of it doesn't make it lawlessness. And so there are a lot of things that people do that violate the law, that are lawlessness, that are sin, that never bother them. That they, they don't feel bad about and society doesn't turn a, 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 a negative eye towards. But when we violate... God's law, whether it be something little, you know, like the, we say the little white lie or the little bit of stealing or whatever might that be, a little bit of deceit or whatever it is, when it violates God's law, it's sin. Look in chapter 5 and verse 17. Chapter 5 and verse 17 where it says all unrighteousness is sin. And so the idea of regardless is of, of how I feel about it, and regardless of what a preacher somewhere says about it or what the church says about it, that really, it really doesn't matter. You know, over time, just watch the news. Churches, if I can use that term, you see my air quotes in the recording, churches change their rules and they change their creeds and all that sort of This doesn't change. What God put in place of his expectations and his law maintains. And the Bible says here that all unrighteousness or lawlessness is sin. Let's move our study to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. The point of, of commitment here that I want us to, to talk about in obedience to God and loving God has to do with my understanding of what He provides for us and what He determines I need. And so in, in Matthew chapter 22 and in verse 36... It says, uh, one of them, a lawyer, verse 35, asked him a question, tested him, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, you remember, sin is lawlessness, so things that violate the law. So what's the greatest commandment in the law? And he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So loving God is the, is the foundation of this all. But loving God is not about feelings. We may have emotion tied to it, but loving God doesn't find itself defined in, in, in just, well, I, I have a certain appreciation for God in, in what we commonly call love. But it, it has the idea of honoring God. Look at verse 38. He says, this is the great and foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. These are called the greatest commandments. Why are they called the greatest commandments? Verse 40. 
On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. The King James Version there puts hang. That's a literal translation. On these hang the law and the prophets. The ESV and New American Standard put depend, and that's interpreted literal. The, the correct translation idea is like a door hanging on hinges. So all the law, every aspect of it, everything that may be added to in the New Testament, or what, everything hinges upon these two things. There's nothing that God expects that doesn't have its foundation back in loving Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and loving your neighbor as yourself. So that foundation and understanding is that that's what God expects. And when I violate that, then I find myself along this path of sin. Sin is lawlessness. I want to show you an example in Romans. Romans chapter 1. We're going to look extensively in Romans 1 for a few minutes. As we talk about man's lost condition, every other command grows out of these two here in Matthew 22, loving God and loving your neighbor. And so loving God, as I said before, is not a sense of I just I feel so good about God. I have this emotional stirring inside myself. Loving God is correlated directly to commandments. Which is the greatest commandment? Loving God, loving your neighbor. And so some sinful attitudes are found in Romans chapter 1. Look in verse 21 to start with. Romans 1, 21. He says, even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculation and their foolish heart was darkened. Honoring God in the text here has with it obedience. It involves it. You see it here when he says, or give him thanks. How do I give him thanks? That requires me to do something. Verse 25. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. So they were serving something. But they were serving the wrong thing. They're serving self. They're serving man. They're not serving God. It sounds like this in our society today. It's my body, my choice. I'll do what I want to do in my body. I'll live how I want to live in my body. And I will do what I want to do. That attitude here is sin. Serving self is sin. And so, he says you need to worship the Creator. Not the creation, the Creator. Why? He's God. He deserves honor. Verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. So the idea is they did not see fit to acknowledge God, didn't honor Him, didn't want to give Him thanks. That's the idea to, to have God in knowledge. That's the literal translation there. Or like the New King James says, didn't like to re, did not like to retain God in their knowledge. It sounds like this today. I don't want to talk about religion. Let's talk about sports. I'm not interested in what it is that, that's going on with God. And so, I would, let's talk about baseball. Anything other than religion. Why don't we want to talk about religion? Well, because there's expectations. And that's the attitude these people were having. That God had an expectation of moral conduct... And they didn't want to participate in that. They instead wanted to serve self. There, if I even say there is a moral and spiritual standard and, and acknowledge that that's there, when I violate it, I recognize I'm guilty of violating that moral standard, whether or not I acknowledge God or not. And so Paul paints the foundation of the gospel here in Romans chapter 1. He says in verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. It's like saying, I know I have a medical condition. I know, it's like saying to yourself, I think I've got cancer. I have all of the signs of it. I have all of the symptoms. And someone tells them, well, have you talked to the doctor? No, no I don't want to go talk to the doctor. Because if I go talk to the doctor, he may do some tests. He may find out I have it. And then if he tells me I have it, now I'll know I have it. So instead of going to find out what's wrong and find the answer, instead we just will live in, in, in denial. 
If I never actually know there's a problem, then it's, then it's fine. It's silliness. We'd say silliness when it comes to our health care. But when we talk about a need for a plan of salvation, sometimes people will say, I don't want to talk about that. Let's, let's figure out what the Cowboys are doing in the offseason. That's what I'm concerned with. Because if I actually determine that I violated God's expectation, I'm in sin. And if I recognize I'm in sin, it requires me to try to figure out what God wants me to do to remedy that problem. And so Paul simply says here, I'm not ashamed of it. I'm going to preach it. And I'm going to let you know what you need and why you need it. And so he starts in verse 18 to show that, and he goes all the way into the, the third chapter with it. In verse 18, he says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The word ungodliness simply means a lack of reverence for God. That's the idea of what he's talking about. So a lack of reverence for God is, I don't want to be told about God. I don't want to hear about Him. That's the idea of ungodliness. Unrighteousness is the conduct that comes out of that. The conduct that is, I fail to see God's standard of what is right. And we see some examples of it in verse 25 and following. So if I just, if I just before we read there in 25 and following, if I just stop and say we started this discussion a few minutes ago, on the basis of there are the two great commandments love God and love your neighbor and I consider what he says in verse 18 which of these two commandments does this violate it violates loving God and so you have this idea now of I don't love God I don't honor God I don't serve him and I don't want to listen to his will I don't want to obey his commandments but when you pick up in verse 26 you have this whole category that starts to change so verse 26 it says for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural and in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts, and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Now, which of the two commandments does that sin violate? Your neighbor. It's how you care for fellow man. So loving God in the context has with it honoring him, respecting him. I'm grateful for everything he gives you. I know the truth about him. I want to worship him and I want to serve him. And then I have to think about doing his will. It's, it's not just recognizing that he is and he needs honor, but it, it plays out in all aspects then of my life. In verse 29, he says, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, envy, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, their gossip. So you, you could, in this, in this text, it would be fine to say, uh, being filled with all unrighteousness, you could put a colon there to list all these things out. Uh, the comma's put there by translators, but... Uh, and the grammar's put there by translators. But you can see the idea that this really defines, this list defines unrighteousness to understand when he says ungodliness and unrighteousness, what all that entails. It's not an exhaustive list of sins. He says here some things. He says wickedness, greed, envy, full of uh, uh, evil, uh, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inv inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. So he goes through and he talks about what unrighteousness is so that they could read, and we can read, to understand the things that are not pleasing to God. It's not an exhaustive list of sins. There's some, there's some big ones that we're like uh, probably able to add to the list that we know are, are sins. Fornication is not listed. Clearly a sin when you go through and read 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9, and 10. You, you, can, you can see divorce. He doesn't talk about divorce uh, in this context and what all the, the rules are about that. But here, here's the point about it. He's trying to get 
the reader to understand that God sets forth a standard for which to live and to which to uh, decide how to interact with fellow man and how to love God and how to love your neighbor as yourself. So it's not an exhaustive list, but kind of broad categories, if you will. Notice verse 32. He says, and without the, and, and although, excuse me, they know the ordinances of God, that those who practice such things. So we know this isn't an exhaustive list. Such things. The people who practice these things are worthy of death. They not only do the same, but they give hearty approval to those who practice them. So these that he talks about are those who practice these things knowing they're in violation of God's commands. The God of the Bible is a God with expectations for his creation. He's a God with commands. He's a God of reality. And so his ordinances for man are for our good. He wants us to do good and receive the blessings that he has. And practicing such things here in the text is in violation of that. Turn forward to chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> Here's an example. This is, this is fearing God, keeping His commandments. So if I love God, then I'm going to love Him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and then I'm going to love my neighbor as myself, and all of God's expectations are built upon those foundations. And in Romans chapter 13 and verse 9, it says, For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, it's summed up in this saying, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So why don't you commit adultery? Why don't you do that? Uh, it's, you say, well, it's, it's simple. I'd get, I'd get caught and I'd get in trouble. No, that's not the reason. It may be an excuse that someone would give, but the reason has to be founded upon something more than that. Well, say, well, I don't want to have to divide my stuff. That's not it. That's not it. Well, it's harmful. It's harmful to my own soul salvation, but it's harmful to my neighbor, my fellow man. It's harmful to my mate. Why don't you steal? Why don't you go about stealing stuff? You see something wrong, why don't you steal it? Because it's harmful to my neighbor. And God's expectation is you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Why don't you covet? Why don't you bear false witness? Whatever you want to talk about there, put it in that understanding that if it's against loving God or it's against loving neighbor, all these things that God puts in place are for our good if we will live that way. And it is shameful to fellow man to have certain attitudes and conduct. So this really reinforces what we began here on this point back in Matthew chapter 22. That I have an expectation to love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength and love my neighbor as myself. There's something else in Romans chapter 1 I'll mention to you before we move on. In, in verse 18... Uh, when we've transgressed in any way these commandments, there's something that comes with it at the beginning of Romans 1.18. He says, for the wrath of God is revealed. You know, God doesn't sit back, like I said this morning, in a rocking chair and just wink at everything and just say, y'all just, you do you and I'm just going to watch and enjoy the show. And, and people just somehow think we just get by and, and, and God's going to, just wink at it all. It's all going to be okay. doesn't matter how you live. doesn't matter the choices you make or all that sort of thing. Read Romans chapter 1, brethren. There is more to it than that. How do we know God feels this way? How do we know that there's the wrath of God? It's been revealed. See it in verse 18? The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. It's not a sin because your preacher tells you it's a sin. It's not a sin because the church gives an ordinance that says it is a sin. 
It is because the Holy Spirit revealed it to you, the mind of God, and it's written and preserved for us to know what pleases God and what doesn't please God. I don't get to determine what sin is. You don't get to determine what sin is. And so in light of that, just thus far in the study, can we say, I've never violated God's law. I've never got, uh, violated what God expects for me to do. And the answer to that for all of us is no. I've violated it at some point in time, and so I have sinned. I have violated at times loving God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I have violated at times loving my neighbor as myself. Look in chapter 2 of Romans and verse 12. Chapter 2 and in verse 12. He says, For all have sinned without the law, uh, for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. What's the function of the conscience? What does the conscience do here in this text? Well, he says that in verse 15, he says their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So it's bearing witness. It's like, it, it's like the movies and the cartoons that used to put the little people on the shoulders of you. There's, there's, this, little, there's this little guy over here that goes, nah, I don't think you ought to do that. I think you're, no. It's something in us that God puts for us to understand based upon right or wrong what we've put into it. You cannot fully trust your conscience for it only has the opportunity to work off the data that is given. But if the data is not faulty, then we ought to be taking a listen to that. Saul of Tarsus is a great example in this. His conscience defended him every day, even though he persecuted Christians. He lacked the data needed for his conscience to operate like God wanted it to. And so, if we are to say... Well, it's not about loving God, it's about loving your neighbor. Well, where's your conscience fit into it? You say, I don't know what God's expectations are. Well, does your conscience tell you you're always doing right? Does your conscience tell you I've done nothing wrong? To ignore your conscience is dangerous. God puts that in you for a purpose. And that's verse 14. When Gentiles who do not have the law, that is the law of Moses... Do instinctively the things of the law. These, not having the law, are law to themselves. So, what he's saying, if I understand the verse, is the Gentiles don't have the Old Testament. They, the Jews did. He's talking to the Jews that become Christians. But the Gentiles had a moral code. They knew what was right. They knew what was wrong. They didn't, they didn't have to have the Old Testament to know it's not okay to take my stuff. They didn't have to have the Old Testament to know that it was wrong to murder. That sort of thing. But to say then I don't care one way or the other when I think something's wrong is the very idea here that I want us to consider. That I recognize wrong that I've done, I need to investigate whether that violates God's will or not and do something then about it. When we say, well, that's wrong. If I admit that something's wrong, then I'm admitting that there's a standard higher than me. And I violated that standard. I may not know anything about the Bible. I may not know anything about Jesus. But the conscience convicts, and that's the idea of what he talks about here. And so while the Gentiles didn't have it, they didn't have the Old Testament with all those laws, they had a conscience. No matter where they lived, that you could bring them to an understanding of, hey, <laughs> you've done wrong. And that's where the foundation that he begins to build upon this is. Turn to chapter 3. Chapter 3, Paul begins a, a, this thread, remember, back in chapter 1 and verse 18. And then he reaches the pinnacle of the thread, in my opinion, in verse 9. And what it says about all men, he says, What then? 
Are we better than they? Not at all. That is, are the Jews better than the Gentiles? What, what is it? He says, For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. In verse 23, he says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so, so what? I guess would be what some people would say. So what I've sinned? Well, look back in chapter 2 for a moment. And in verse 7, chapter 2, and in verse 7, it says, To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Verse 10, But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Turn forward to chapter 8. Now I just want you to see this theme throughout the, the letter. Chapter 8. And verse 18, where he says, For I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And in verse 21, that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The glory of God is the theme throughout. He wants us to be saved. He does not want us to die in our sin. He wants to give man eternal life. He wants to give man in the resurrection an opportunity to be free from the condemnation of guilt. But there's an alternative. Chapter 2 and verse 8. There's an alternative where he says, But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. And so it is that he talks about all who sin and fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. We didn't cover that one even yet. But wrath and indignation and tribulation, the idea of death, he wants us to be saved from the guilt of sin. He's not talking about physical death in these verses, but the wages of my sin and the wages of your sin. The wages of my unlawfulness. And I didn't serve Him as I should have. And so man has a sin problem. It's a serious problem. It's one that on our own we can do nothing about. And it is due to have tremendous consequences. And if the sermon were to end here, and I was just to tell you, hey, that's it. You know, once you sin and you violate God's law, that's the, that's the end of it. And if you, and, and you die, uh, God would be just in that, but we would all be pretty sad about it. Fact is, God's done something to remedy the sin problem. And if man were to die without having his sins removed, it would be tragic, but the good news is, in Luke chapter 19, and verse 10, where it simply says about Jesus, where he says, The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. He came to deal with the sin problem. All the good deeds that we could do and all the undoing we could try to do to remedy sin accomplishes nothing. I cannot go back in time and undo sin that I've done. I can, I can work on what I'm doing right now and working forward, but, but I'm, I'm due death from those sins in the past. That's the wage that I'm due from that. But He offers unto me an opportunity to be reconciled back to God. He didn't come so that we could have a better economy. It, it may be nice that we have a good economy, but he didn't come for that purpose. He didn't come so that we could change politics in our country. That, that's not why he came. Or that we could work on social needs or civic beautification so that we could work on planting gardens in the median of the highways. That's not what Jesus' purpose was. I know, I know some focus on that. Trying to change laws, trying to work in politics, all that sort of stuff. Uh, trying to do all sort of things that may be good things. They may be good things in and of themselves. But that's not the purpose for which Jesus came. 
And that's not the purpose that He wants for us to understand. That's not what the Gospel is about. The Gospel is about a fact that man sins. And because of that, we're in a lost condition and we need a Savior. We need a Messiah to save us. And He paid the price for our sin. He just wants us to submit to Him. To submit to His will as is revealed in the Scriptures. But it begins with our study tonight. I have to first and foremost recognize my sins, my lost condition, and then recognize that I need to submit to Him in order to take advantage of what He offers to us. If we can be in assistance with that for you this evening, let us know as we stand together.